Good morning and hello everybody. I want to welcome you to our Sunday morning service and if this is your first time with us, a special warm welcome. I hope you enjoy being part of our online worshipping community today. So in today's service, after we've looked briefly at our notices, we've got some Bible readings coming up from Peter Goodyear. Angela Godwin is going to lead our prayers. I'm going to be preaching for you today and we've got our usual mix of what I hope are popular hymns, which I hope will warm your heart. So shall we start with those notices? First of all, if you're new today or you just fancy a chat, we've got coffee with the vicar on Zoom between 10 and 11 this morning and details of how to join in with that are there on our weekly newsletter and also on the website. And if you can't get along to that or you just want to chat something through another time, do please send me an email or get in touch by the phone. This evening at 6 o'clock or from 6 o'clock we've got a nice gentle service of evening prayer. Um, you can Join in with that any time after 6 o'clock. It doesn't have to be there at 6 o'clock on the nose. Um, it's simply there available pre-recorded on our website from then. And then on Wednesday at half past 6, you can join us for a slightly different type of midweek communion service. It's not really a communion service at all. It's an agape supper. And we're doing that again over Zoom. So do tune into Zoom at half past 6 on Wednesday evening. The details of how to do that will be there on our website. And any liturgy you will need for it will also be there as it will be different to what we normally use. Finally, we can produce these services on DVD and CD now. So if you do know of anybody who hasn't got access to the internet but would like to see them, please get in touch with me and let's see what we can do. Right, shall we quieten our hearts? And we're going to begin our worship by inviting God to open our lips so that we can proclaim his praise. O oh Lord, open our lips and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. And let's open our worship by singing a wonderful hymn, O oh, Worship the King, All Glorious Above. And why don't we stand for that if you feel able? As we stand, let's pray together. Bless the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Sing his praise and exalt him forever. The night has passed and the day lies open before us. Let us pray with one heart and mind. As we rejoice in the gift of this new day, 
So may the light of your presence, O God, set our hearts on fire with love for you, now and forever. Amen. Please will you take a seat. Brothers and sisters, the Holy Scripture call us in various places to acknowledge and confess our many sins and wickedness, and that we should not try to hide them before the face of Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, but instead confess them with a humble, lowly, penitent and obedient heart, so that we may obtain forgiveness of them by his infinite goodness and mercy. And although we ought at all times humbly to acknowledge our sins before God, we ought to do so especially when we assemble and come together to give thanks for his great blessings, the ones we've received at his hands, to offer the praise that's due to him, to hear his most holy word, and to ask him to supply our needs of body and soul. Therefore I ask and call you all to approach the throne of heavenly grace with me, humbly and with pure intent, saying, Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the evil intentions and desires of our own hearts. We have broken your holy laws. We have left undone what we ought to have done, and we have done what we ought not to have done and thus there is no wholeness within us. Lord, have mercy on us, pitiful sinners. Spare those who confess their sins. Restore those who truly repent, even as you have promised through Jesus Christ our Lord. And grant, merciful Father, for his sake, that we may live hereafter a godly, righteous and holy life, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. And may Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon us, pardon and deliver us from all our sins, confirm and strengthen us in all goodness, and keep us in life eternal, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, our first Bible reading today picks up that theme of forgiveness and hope through Jesus' death on the cross. Peter Goodyear then is going to read to us the first eight verses of Romans chapter 5. The reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Romans, chapter 5. Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand, and we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly, Indeed, rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person someone might actually dare to die. But God proves his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, thank you for that, Peter. Before we have our second reading, we're going to sing again. It's a hymn you would normally sing during Advent. But because our, our second reading and our, our theme this morning is very much about the coming of the kingdom of God and proclaiming the coming of the kingdom of God, I thought we'd fast forward through the church year to Advent, if you don't mind. And we're going to sing, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus. Why don't you stand for this?
Well, do please take a seat. In a moment, I'm going to come and bring God's word for today. But first, Peter's going to bring us our second reading. The reading from the Gospel according to St. Matthew, chapter 9, beginning at verse 35. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and curing every disease and every sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them, because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Then Jesus summoned his twelve disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to cure every disease and every sickness. These are the names of the twelve apostles. First, Simon, also known as Peter, and his brother Andrew. James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. Philip and Bartholomew. Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector. James, son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus. Simon, the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Go nowhere among the Gentiles, and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, proclaim the good news. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. You received without payment, give without payment. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, may your kingdom come. May you show us our part in it today. We ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Albin Pereira was born into an Indian and Portuguese family in Kenya. But he grew up in England. And back in 2016, he successfully completed a four-year leadership development scheme with his employer. And he started applying for management posts. He didn't get the first one he applied for, or the second, or the third. In fact, after being knocked back eight times, he began to wonder what was up. And so he went to head office and he asked to look at his personnel file. And in there, he found a green piece of paper written by the regional manager. And this is what it said. Having worked closely with people from the Indian subcontinent in the past, I think there are cultural differences in the way people like Olwyn communicate and actually handle issues of truth and clarity. In other words, the regional manager was saying that all people from the Indian subcontinent have a potential issue with communication and they may well be liars. And Olwyn thinks that was what stopped him getting a job. Let's face it, that is a pretty dangerous thing to write in somebody's file, isn't it? And especially when I tell you that the company Alwyn Pereira was trying to work for was the Diocese of Bristol, and the regional manager was the Bishop of Bristol at that time. I hope that story makes you angry. Because if it does, you're echoing the Father Heart of God. We've been hearing a lot about race, about Black Lives Matter, in the media in the last fortnight because there have been some awful things happening and I think the harder we look at ourselves and our own pasts the more we may recognize that we've got things wrong because in the church of Jesus Christ there should be no place for racism the picture of heaven the Bible gives us is of a great multitude of people from every nation every tribe every people every language all standing before the throne of God and of the Lamb it's a picture of unity, of equality and racial harmony where everyone is welcome. Which means there's no way a Christian could ever say, you're not the right sort of person. Your sort aren't welcome here. You might know the old joke about the piece of string that walks into a bar and orders a beer. The bartender says, I'm sorry, we don't serve string here. 
A few minutes later, the string tries again, and the bartender again says, I'm sorry, but we don't serve strings here. So the string goes away into the washroom, and he ties himself into a loop, and then he rubs his head up against the side of the sink to mess up the top of his hair. And then he walks back up to the bar and again asks for a beer. And the bartender takes a good look at him and says, Hey, aren't you a string? And the string replies, No, I'm afraid not. Everyone is welcome in the kingdom of God. But if that's the case, why does Jesus seem to make that rather strange racial distinction in our reading? Did you notice him there? Sending his disciples to the lost sheep of Israel, but not to the Gentiles and the Samaritans. What, what's going on? Is Jesus being racist? Are we going to have to worry about Black Lives Matter protesters attacking churches next? Well, I do hope not. Because you don't have to read very far in the Bible to see that actually Jesus is the fulfilment of an ancient promise from God to bless not one race, but all races, to bless all nations. A promise Jesus repeats himself at his ascension when he sends his followers to proclaim the good news to the ends of the earth. The good news of the kingdom of God is for everyone. Everyone is welcome. No one is excluded because of the colour of their skin or their nationality or their gender. No matter who you are, God is for you. The bigger question many of us face is, are you for God? Because if you are, he has the best news ever for you. It was there in verse 7 of our reading where Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven has come near. It's really exciting to be near something, isn't it? In a few weeks' time, my family and I, we're all hoping to head off on holiday to France, God and coronavirus willing. And, and even just thinking about the possibility of that holiday is whetting my appetite. I'm already thinking about the smell of all those delicious croissants and baguettes and those wonderful French cheeses. Although, to be fair, to get a reminder of those, I usually just need to go into one of my son's bedrooms. But jokes about smelly trainers aside, when Jesus tells us the kingdom of heaven is near, he's saying it's so close to fulfillment that we can anticipate and experience some of it already. That's exciting, isn't it? But before we get to that, let me back up a little bit, because maybe you're with us for the first time today, or you just simply don't understand what this kingdom of heaven stuff actually is. So I want to give you three quick ways to think about it. First of all, the kingdom of heaven it's like the, it's the rule of Jesus Christ here on earth. Now, Queen Elizabeth has a kingdom, doesn't she? And Jesus does too. Her kingdom is geographical. Jesus is spiritual. He is the spiritual ruler of this whole world. Second, the kingdom of heaven is a term used to describe the people who worship Jesus. They're the people who obey him and see him as their king, the church. And thirdly, the kingdom of heaven is a term we use to speak of the blessings and the advantages that flow from living under Christ's rule. You see, we all know that this world we live in is a mess. I'm not surprising anybody when I say that, am I? We all know that propensity we have to muck things up. But one day, all that brokenness and all the wickedness in our world, all the racism, the violence, all the dishonesty and deceit, all the damage we're doing to the environment, one day all of that will come to an end and it will be replaced by God's kingdom coming in all its glory. That's the day when God will make everything new, when he'll make the whole world over, when he'll restart everything from the bottom up. Here's how the Bible describes it. There'll be no more death, no more mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. Isn't that a beautiful thought? Because that's the ultimate end point of the Christian hope. When you're sat there in despair watching the TV news, when you're crying over the latest unspeakable atrocity, wondering when justice is coming, when's the violence going to stop? When are those arguments going to stop at home? When will the mess come to an end? Your answer is when God's kingdom comes in all its glory. And while a lot of people get bogged down in endlessly specul about, speculating about when that will be, the more important question is how can I be part of that in the here and now? And the answer, as it is with so much in Christianity, is Jesus. He's the way in. You see, the kingdom of God has a king. And to become part of his kingdom, you need to bow the knee to him. Which is a tough thing to do if you're one of those proud folks 
who won't bow the knee to anyone. But it's the only way in. Bowing the knee means saying sorry. It means saying, I've gone wrong. It might mean you have to go and fix things in your life or make reparations in the life of someone else. And it certainly means that you're going to live the rest of your life differently. Because now, instead of serving King Yu, you're serving King Jesus. Look at the difference that service made to the 12 guys Jesus called into his service in the passage. There was nothing special about these chaps. They hadn't undergone extensive recruitment and selection training before Jesus invited them to follow them. They hadn't done a four-year training course with the diocese or anything like that. There's nothing special about them at all except for their king. He's the special one. And look, chapter 10, verse 1, he gives them power to go and do extraordinary things like drive out demons and heal illness and heal disease. And then verse 8, he tells them to go and heal those who are ill, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy and drive out demons. He's very matter of fact about it. Just I'll give you the power to do it. Now go and do it. Scary. Being part of the kingdom of God means that you're going to live the rest of your life differently because now Jesus is your king. So let me ask, do you want to be part of that? Do you want to serve a king who can equip you to go and live for others and transform lives forever? Because that's the other extraordinary part of the kingdom of God. Although it won't come fully until some date in the future, it also comes true partly in the present, in the here and now, which is why Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is near. And just like we can get a foretaste of France by nipping down to the co-op to have a, a croissant in the here and now, it's also possible to get a foretaste of heaven in the here and now. Or rather, for us to be that foretaste of the kingdom of heaven. You see, we get to be the aroma of Christ. That's what St. Paul calls the Christians in Corinth. He says, we are to God the pleasing aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. I wonder what aroma people get when they smell you or me. Is it the aroma of Christ or something a little less inviting? Because let's be honest, some of the things Christians do stink. Some of our business practices stink. Some of our employment and recruitment practices stink. Some of the ways we treat each other stink. Some of the things we obsess over stink. Thank God then, that some of the stuff we do also smells great. It smells of Christ. In my last church, we used to run a community fun day twice a year. It wasn't a fundraiser. That's normally what, you, what normally follows when you put that word community in a title. It wasn't a community fundraiser. It was a community fun day. We used the day to give things away to our community. It was a day for blessing them, as Jesus said in our reading. Verse 8, freely you have received, freely give. The best thing about the Community Fun Day, I think, was the free barbecue we'd run on the street outside the church. And as a fan of barbecues, I tell you, it did smell good. But as a servant of the Kingdom of Heaven, it smelled even better because it had the aroma of Christ. And a number of people came to faith in Christ because of the witness and outreach that we were able to do around that barbecue. We are the aroma of Christ. We're a foretaste, a glimpse of Heaven here on Earth. And that means we're kingdom builders. Now what being a kingdom builder will look like for each of us will be a bit different. It could mean you give your life to working for justice and reconciliation, working to help the poor and the needy. It could mean working to transform the environment. We're God's stewards over creation. We're his caretakers. We're probably not doing that great a job, are we? Being a kingdom builder means being ready to pray for healing. Praying God's future down into the present life of someone who's suffering. But Jesus doesn't just send his followers out to show kindness to the community, although that is a good thing. He sends us also to proclaim the reason for that kindness. As you go, he says, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. He's inviting us to be walking, talking billboards, pointing people to the kingdom of heaven. So as we draw to a close, let me ask you, what's your mission in the kingdom of God? You see, we all have a mission. If you're part of the kingdom of God, you're part of the team and God has a role for you. Something he created you in advance, something he planned in advance for you to do. 
So what's your mission in the kingdom of God? And please don't try to suggest to me that you're too old or that you've done your bit. I do hear that quite a lot. The king of kings doesn't do retirements. Though he does let you change your role and slow down if you're not able to work as fast as you were in the past. What's your mission in the kingdom of God? Well, I'm simply going to invite you to bow your head now. And I'm going to pray and I'm going to invite God to speak to us through his Holy Spirit. And maybe he will today answer that question for you. What's your mission in the kingdom of God? Let's pray. Father God, we bow the knee before you now. Give us our marching orders. Show us your plans and purposes for our lives. And fill us with Holy Spirit power so that we can do your will. So look, I'm going to be quiet now for a moment. Let's just say what, see what God is going to say to us in this time. Father, we long to be the aroma of Christ in our communities. But we know sometimes we stink of other things instead. Help us to see ourselves through your eyes so that we can know the depth of our failure, but also the limitless grace and mercy and forgiveness that you offer us through Jesus. Thank you for him. Thank you for his death on the cross and that his kingdom is near. May we be heralds of that kingdom and serve you faithfully forevermore. Amen. The kingdom of God is near. So what's your mission? Well, if you'd like to talk any more about that at another time, perhaps about what the Lord has been saying to you through this today, do get in touch with me. In the meantime, God bless and thanks for listening. So what's your mission in the kingdom of God? Why don't we continue inviting God to speak to us as we respond to him in song by singing the kingdom of God is justice and joy. And why don't we stand for this? <laughs>
And as we continue to stand, let's declare our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Amen. Now why don't you take a seat and Angela Godwin is going to come and lead us in prayer. In the power of the Spirit and in union with Christ, let us pray to the Father. We begin in joyful thankfulness for the beauty of God's creation at its very best at this time of year. And we give thanks to God for his infinite kindness and love in sending Jesus to give his life that we might know peace with God. Father God, we bring before you the needs of the world, especially those areas of conflict and natural disaster that now also have the coronavirus to deal with. On top of drought in Africa, locusts in India, floods in Indonesia and conflict in many parts of Africa. We see the effects of isolation mounting in our own land with reports of more domestic violence, unemployment and poverty. Lord, through all the difficult times we share with so many across the world, we pray for your peace and grace to wear the crown in our lives, not the virus, not the anxiety it brings. We thank you for small signs of improvement. Inspire us to open our hearts and minds to creating a new normal out of our restored freedoms when they come a kinder world of truth and generosity. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving Father, we pray for teachers, for our children and young people in these strange times, for parents homeschooling and maybe not finding that too easy. We pray for school leavers unsure how to plan their future, Lord, you placed us in families and you love young people. Draw close so that this becomes a time of spiritual growth, a time of maturing and innovation as they and we search for ways forward. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father God, we pray for our church. We, the people, are separated from our buildings for the time being. Help us to be your presence in the community, our villages. And may our church buildings stand as beacons of hope, symbols of healing to all who pass by. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father God, we pray for the Queen and all the royal family. For our government, especially those charged with decision-making in these challenging times, we ask your blessing on key workers across the nation and pray for your protection to keep them safe. Bring healing to those who suffer and comfort to their loved ones. We remember those whose urgent treatments have been postponed because of the virus asking your peace that passes understanding as they await appointments. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father God, in the wake of the murder of George Floyd, we ask you to root out discrimination and injustice in our hearts, that fairness and equality might emerge. Help us to live out your command to love our neighbour as ourselves, to welcome the stranger at our gate. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. 
Loving Father, we pray for the sick and suffering among us, remembering especially Sue Harborn, Julian Fox, Pam Morton, Dorothy Meredith, Jane McKay, the Wills family, Pat Pepman, Sue and Di, and Adrian Taylor's daughter. For those in isolation who struggle with loneliness and, and depression, we pray. For those in our care homes. For those who are bereaved, especially those who have not been able to be near their loved ones in their last hours. Bind up the brokenhearted and bless them with peace, assuring them of your promise of eternal life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Now let's keep a moment of silence and bring to the Lord those personal matters that lie most on our hearts today. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you for that, Angela. We're going to continue in prayer as we pray the church's special prayer, the Collect for the first Sunday of Trinity. O God, the strength of all those who put their trust in you, mercifully accept our prayers. And because through the weakness of our mortal nature, we can do no good thing without you, grant us the help of your grace. So in the keeping of your commandments, we may please you both in will and deed. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And standing at the foot of the cross, let's pray with confidence the prayer our Saviour has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Well, we're coming towards the end of our time together today. And as we've been thinking very much about Jesus' words, to go and tell everyone that the kingdom of heaven is near, I thought we should finish with a song that's all about our marching orders. So we're going to stand and we're going to sing, stand up, stand up for Jesus, you soldiers of the cross. Please would you stand for this one. <laughs>
do please take a seat. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this morning's service and that it's been a blessing and an encouragement to you. Do please encourage others to come along and get involved with these services on a week by week basis and join in with some of the other things we're doing day by day as well. We have a daily prayer service and a number of other services through the course of the week. And if this has been your first time worshipping with us, I hope especially it's been a good time for you. We're here same time next week. And if there's anything we can help you with in the meantime on your spiritual journey, do please get in touch. We long for the day when we can all gather together again. But in the meantime, stay safe and stay prayerful. And so may the Lord bless us and keep us in eternal life. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. We're going to finish with the words of the grace. <laughs> may the grace, the grace of our Lord, Lord Jesus Christ, Christ. Christ. And the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, and the Amen.